Thank you for joining us for ASU Gamage Digital Connections. My name is Sara R. Mateen. And my name is Anthony James Procopio, and this is Each Measure. Each Measure highlights a variety of ASU students' creative processes during the COVID-19 pandemic. This time challenges us to think creatively and look at art forms in a new way. We and ASU Gamage would like to thank all of our sponsors who provide funding for our cultural participation and community programs. Hello everyone. Um, we are a composer lyricist team who have been working on a musical for the past year and we're just kind of here to talk to you about the crazy process that it's been. Honestly, writing Leading Ladies has been such a rewarding experience for both of us and I think the full team. Um, we first started writing in January 26th of 2020 which um, funnily enough was actually the first day that we found COVID cases in Arizona. So this kind of became um, the COVID baby musical. Uh, but honestly, it was such an interesting experience because of the limitations and the obstacles and the hurdles that came from what 2020 ended up being. Yeah, so 2020 has kind of followed the perfect journey with our musical, both of like the craziness of COVID and all the challenges it's provided while we're both going on like an artistic journey together, writing our first musical together. This was our first collaboration. We. Me and Anthony knew we wanted to write together. We actually both work at Gamage in front of house staff, and that's how we met. Um, and we both figured out that we were interested in writing for musical theater. And so we kind of sat down one day, we're like, we're going to write a musical. Don't know what it's about. <laughs> so kind of at the end of 2019, we sat for weeks and weeks. We'd go to Payway and just kind of had these artistic meetings. And, you know, we'd call them like brainstorm meetings, and then we'd really just wait for inspiration to strike <laughs> and so it wasn't until the top of 2020 when i was sitting in a class and all of a sudden like a full plot outline and a whole original story came to me um and during that class i wrote the full first outline for what is now um leading ladies a new musical which will be having its online premiere this year um and so in class i was like fiercely writing this outline came to anthony um at payway kind of gave him the whole thing um which is now um the story of ella lark that takes place um she lives in 1957 it is the height of the hollywood musical legacy um and a studio is faced with the problem that you know they're doing their first musical and their leading lady really can't sing so they bring ella lark along to dub for them and be a ghost singer um and she gets really close to the leading lady, Charlotte Finley, who she's singing for, um, but kind of gets caught in the fact that she can't tell Charlotte she's singing for her. And now they're really close friends. And there's a lot of drama that ensues from there. And from like the launching point of having that story, we just began writing like no other. <laughs> and something fun that we wanted to explore, and this is something that Sarah and I had both made very clear in like our initial goals for writing the show was that we wanted to have a story that was realistic. And we say realistic in the sense to talk about how, unfortunately, like life is never picturesque. Um, and so we see sometimes that like, when you have ambitions and you have opportunities, sometimes like the hard answer of saying, you know, maybe this is not the best option, or maybe this is things, or maybe this is changing who I am, ends up needing to be something that you need to address. And so we wanted to kind of add things, add that kind of theme to the overall story of um, that idea, that the world of um, movie musical Hollywood, especially because there were so many women, countless women, honestly, that um, were, you know, ghost singers in the room um, and that were never really known to the public for their work in these movies and the impact that that not only had on the industry, but also on the leading women themselves. Yeah, exactly. It's semi-inspired by real events. Um, Marnie Nixon is an amazing woman who, in like early 60s, gave so many Hollywood actresses their voice for them. Um, so Deborah Kerr and King and I was dubbed by Marnie, but Marnie didn't get any of the credit. Natalie Wood in West Side Story. And there's just so many instances of this kind of amazing thing of what is it like to give someone the voice, have like the talent to pull off a leading role, but not get any of the accolation for it. And that was just a conflict that interested both of us so much. So we sat down to, after we got the whole outline, um, we sat down to write. 
And the first song we wrote together, the show starts really chipper and gets progressively darker. So this is from act one. It's very fun. This is the first song we wrote for the show. Um, you could be famous from leading ladies, a new musical. You could be famous. You'll make it famous and have your name etched in the pavement of a Hollywood star. You could be famous. How could you blame us for saying how much of a talent you are? First day, pay close attention, honey. Next day, you're making lots of money. If you pretend you're famous, then as the weeks go, no one will know that you went famous. Nobody's famous. If you believe you're someone, then it's bound to come true. Trust, dear, we've done it before. Fate is knocking, so come open the door. So, darling, what do you say? I say I could never pull it off. Not with that attitude, you own. You could be famous, how lovely fame is, to be named in every household as America's doll. You could be famous, and when you're famous, your needs are met before you've known them at all. I started out as a secretary struck by a chance so extraordinary. One day there's no director in sight. I put on his hat and ran the show after that. So now I'm famous to make it famous. You follow in the footsteps of the stars of before. Trust, dear, let's make something new. You've got a voice, so you deserve a debut. Thank you but I'm not the girl you're looking for. Well, we can't leave without a singer. I think you can. Good night, sweet dreams, for that's what I call this girl's got dreams, but she won't fall for you, dear. Hear what I'm saying, cause I'm not about to throw away the promise that I made to stay. Here's your problem, darling, in case you didn't know. There's more to life than famous, so I think you'd better go. I need some space, you've made your case, split every argument. I'm not your next Investment, so don't waste a single cent. Let's make it clear I'm not against the thought of living like a star. But I've made a commitment to my father and this bar. It hurts to hear you lay a plan I feel I could achieve. I'd like to follow through, but I have to leave this as a dream. So, you're content here for the rest of your life? Yes, of course. I'm certain. People don't tend to hesitate when they're certain. How much do you love to say? More than anything, but I can't. But you didn't take a breath to answer that. Trust, dear, lend us your hand. Dreams can come true.
Having the chance to write uh, Leading Ladies, and specifically this number, You Could Be Famous, was honestly such a big turning point for us in this overall production. Because at that point, we were able to find, like, for me, my musical voice with the show, for her, her, like, lyrical voice with the show. And it was the first chance we had to kind of flesh out the characters. And something so, like, extremely exciting about it is the fact that we could see where the characters were going to head in the story. Oftentimes in this beautiful industry of Hollywood, it's very picturesque, as we said before, and very, you know, a happily ever after. And knowing that we're going to have this whole conversation about consequences and a whole conversation about what happens then, it becomes a really interesting story. And we were so excited just to begin starting it at this point. Yeah, it was. And we were able, so I wrote the book and the lyrics for the show and Anthony did the music. And we wrote You Could Be Famous in a practice room at ASU and kind of like the thrill of writing together for the first time and getting that done and getting to know our characters. It's not the first song in the show. We didn't start at the beginning as very few people do because it's kind of hard to do a beginning. Now it's really cool, <laughs> but we definitely weren't ready for it then. Um, we, wrote, we wrote You Could Be Famous and the first couple songs in person. And then come March, the world kind of changed. And so our writing process also had to follow that change, of course. Um, so after what was like the spring break of my senior year, um, <laughs> ASU switched fully onto Zoom. And, you know, we were obviously taking the pandemic and the state of things very seriously. And so everyone was kind of in lockdown. Um, and so Anthony and I switched to fully writing on Zoom. We still continued exactly kind of as we were. Um, we, you know, met probably three times every week to do writing sessions. After the semester ended and summer started, we <laughs> would call each other the night before and be like, hey, what time do you think you're going to wake up tomorrow? Okay, we're going to meet then. <laughs> and we would just roll out of bed, <laughs> turn on Zoom, and begin writing for hours because, you know, neither of us had like a social life or jobs really at that point because we were both in lockdown. And... I'm not, I don't know, what do you think, Anthony? Do you think we could have written the show as fast as we did if it wasn't for being in lockdown? Because we, I mean, like, from January to October, rehearsal started in October. Honestly, no. I mean, I think, I think we could have made it close. But obviously, like, the luxury, I say that sarcastically, <laughs> the luxury of being stuck at home for several months, um, it kind of forced you to find something to do with yourself to kind of keep yourself motivated. And I think that was such an internal drive for both of us. And actually, the accessibility of being able to work on Zoom, instead of having to drive to, let's say, each other's houses or go to campus, it actually it worked out really, really well. It was kind of like yeah. the stars aligned in a very unfortunate situation. Yeah. I'm really interested to see, because we have plans to try later this month to write a one-act musical in 72 hours, um, which is a fully separate thing. But we're going to get to write in person again, probably. And it's been a long time, so let's... <laughs> I just think that's interesting. And of course, we should preface that, like, the world is not fully better. So writing in person also means, like, masked and also making sure people are tested and such beforehand. But it's just interesting that, like, so many... Because we've basically found our footing as artists in the face of the pandemic. And I think, like, as we continue throughout our careers and, like, as the world allows us to do more things the normal way, I think we might have, like, a moment of, like, oh, we have to adapt to what everyone else has been dealing with their entire lives. Another like benefit of the craziness of the world was that while um, we were writing, um, Artemis Theatrical, which is a writers group in New York, started opening up their meetings to writers throughout the states, which I was able to join and bring in stuff from leading ladies to those writers meetings. I never would have gotten to join a New York writers group had that not happened because the meetings were over Zoom. I got to talk with like amazing people who've gotten their masters and like lyricism and all of that, and so. I feel like the artistic community really took this time to kind of like help everyone in face of everything. And I think that's something that, you know, kind of kept us going throughout the, all the hard times. Absolutely. I think, honestly, that's a great segue into what the production looked like for this show. Yeah. Because like circumstances often, you know, drive what ends up happening. And so because we had to adapt so much, we had to look at how we could take the original plans of an in-person production 
which was, you know, the plan all the way back in January, to adapting it in a world where we couldn't even have more than one singer in a space, which I think was the biggest blow to those dreams of, of full staging. Um, yeah. However, we ended up looking at what we could do instead to make the most of this production because we knew that we wanted to have a cast. We knew we wanted to have a full sort of production to be able to see the show in its full capacity. And so we started talking about what's doable with the, te uh, the technology and equipment that we know people have. Um, and that's when we started talking about a professional film reading. And so we looked at basically making a large recording, doing film chunks um, of the scenes and the songs and being able to put it together in a wonderful, almost movie-esque kind of production which is the final product that we'll be displaying in February. Yeah, it was amazing to adapt, honestly, because, you know, you envision like traditionally first workshops, you've got a full cast and you get to do staging and all of that. But when we realized like, you're not going to be able to have two singers in the same room, like right next to each other and dancing and doing choreography and blocking all of that. We really kind of, you know, took it into our hands of like, okay, what are, you know, forms of final products that have lasted throughout the times that don't require like in-person staging and an audience. And immediately we're like, oh, film, they've been doing it for years. You know, we don't have to figure out a new technique at all. We'll just use theirs. Um, and it was honestly amazing. So in October, we cast the first workshop production of Leading Ladies, a new musical. We got an amazing cast and an amazing crew. Um, that we were able to audition and call back completely virtually before we started in-person rehearsals that were outdoors. Um, and that auditioning virtually was honestly just like a really interesting process. I kind of liked it. <laughs> it was honestly like a breeze because, I mean, traditionally you would have them obviously come in and you want to work with them. Um, and it's difficult over Zoom because there's delay and you're not there in person with them. Um, and if we had, let's say, had like a choreography component of the show, then that would have been hindered by a virtual audition process. But since we were then deciding on a reading at that point, um, we knew that we just wanted to focus on how well could they act and portray these characters, and how well could they sing. And so Sara and I actually had a really fun process of um, having breakout rooms in our Zoom calls. So initially we would have them submit an audition tape sort of thing, they would submit a video through a link. Um, and then what we would do is then in the first wave of auditions when we would have them come in, um, we would have a little breakout room and um, we would be able to then work with them. I was able to work with them musically over Zoom. I would have them look at excerpts from uh, the show and I'd be able to work with range, how well they were able to pick up music and learn it. Um, and Sara was able to um, try different scenes and have them read together, which I think adds to the fact that these characters themselves are of course new to meeting each other and these actors themselves were also new to meeting each other. And it added yeah. a really interesting parallel dynamic that I think really helped the process flesh itself out. Yeah, absolutely. And it was, you really got to see, because virtually, kind of all the excess fluff of casting is gone. As, like, I grew up acting a long time myself, and I think the most, like, agonizing part of a callback experience was the moment where they would line you all up by height order and just kind of stare at you for a minute and really take into account, like, how do you look? And that's a lot of times a big part of casting. Um, and I just always, as a person who, like, when I was younger, I was really tall. I'm now pretty average, but just, like, oh, they're definitely making sure I'm not taller than whoever they're thinking of for the leading man and all of that. And so over Zoom, even though you can see people, what people look like is, like, it's taken away for you. You're really just looking at how are they emoting, how are they treating the lines, who, even over Zoom, has chemistry together, who has a good read and electricity back and forth with the dialogue. Um, and it was really just, and then like meeting them in person and seeing all of that come to life for you. I really, I don't know if I would do it again. I still obviously like meeting people and, you know, I'm a very social person, but I, I really think it allowed you to say who is the best for these roles. And I truly believe we got a cast that was absolutely for the best for these roles. They all did the amazing feat of originating entirely new characters. Um, I don't think we'll ever forget this cast. There's no way. Now, when you think and of these characters think, cast. Absolutely. And I think this becomes a, especially apparent when we started rehearsals. Um, yeah. The rehearsal process was, I think, especially unique. And we talked about adapting. I think this was the biggest adapting we had to do um, because we ended up rehearsing completely outside. And so yeah. we would rehearse both on ASU campus by the School of Music. We would reserve the space outside, like the FAC. 
Um, or we would then rehearse at Sara's house because she has a wonderful tennis court in the back. And so either way, the, our cast would be distanced. They'd be um, wearing masks the entire time. And we would encourage them to be getting tested regularly, which of course, you know, they were happy to do because of safety. Um, but then it posed the interesting conflict of, well, now we got to get a keyboard plugged out here. Now we got to get a yeah. speaker. Oh, now it's getting extremely cold. How do we stay warm? <laughs> How do you sing through masks? How do you set up an entire rehearsal when it's getting dark outside at 8 p.m., you know? It was cute. It was a really cute setup. And it really rooted... Anthony and I think, how, like, my favorite thing about working with you is that neither of us accept no for an answer. We're entirely willing to change. Entirely willing to change and adapt to scenarios. But a lot of people were telling us this fall, you know, maybe just wait. You know, you don't want your first production to be kind of like this filmed production. Like, you know, it's always easier to do, like, something in person. Just wait for the world to get better. And we said, we know we can do something amazing, even with the limitations. It just means we have to change our outlook on this. And so when it was entirely difficult to reserve an in-person, like, a building um, for rehearsals, we said, okay, how are we going to keep people safe? And the logical thing, I just, I remember sending Anthony this video when I got the brain blast for it. Um, I was at my parents' house and I was looking outside of the tennis car. I was like, rehearsal's here. And I sent Anthony this video. I was like, here's where the piano can be. Here's where this can be. And we're just, you know, going to take the problems that were handed and absolutely solve them um, in a way that's going to, you know, benefit us. And it's just as good in the end, you know, a little bit hands-on, a little bit, you know, I had to get there early every day and do the setup of the socially distanced chairs and do all that. A little extra work, but, you know, we got it done. 100% <laughs> worth it. And our cast was extremely flexible with everything. And they, they, were, they were happy to have any sort of rehearsing, any sort of production. Um, yeah. And they were, because of their flexibility, I think, like, that's what made this show. When we talk about the actual, like, content of the show with the music and, like, the scenes, we would constantly, like, you know, revise a little thing here, change this here based on how they would portray it. Or let's say, you know, if our leading, not our leading lady, Cassie, um, <laughs> if she was like, hmm, this is a little bit uncomfortable for this jump in the music, then I would say, okay, let's work with this. And the nice thing about an original cast is that we can shape these characters and these parts to our actors. And so things would wildly be changing, um, but at the same time we'd be solidifying. And it was a great part of the revision process. Similarly, mm -hmm. when I worked with um, our pit, we had um, two keyboardists. I was the main keyboardist. Um, we had a bass player and then our drummer. That was on its own an interesting process because we were putting together orchestrations as a group. Traditionally, you might have those already at hand, but because of the time scale of the show, I knew I could trust those performers to give it their all and to work and to find parts that they felt were that they felt were appropriate and, and contributing while also doable. And so it was such a fun experience to work with, honestly, such flexible musicians and cast members. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I loved our band. <laughs> and that was band, so we had rehearsals, then we added band and pit rehearsals. Um, and so that kind of wrapped up the rehearsal process for us. And then we moved into actual production, our actual filming days. Um, which our recording studio, truly one of a kind. <laughs> um, we, hard to find space in this time, um, that, you know, is large enough to, you know, have the amount of singers that we had 11, um, cast members, um, and still be safe. And we, like, that was always our number one priority. Me and Anthony joked of, like, safety first, production second, Anthony and Sarah's sleep schedules at the bottom of the priority list. <laughs> Um, and so that was a major concern of ours. And when we were looking at, okay, you know, obviously we want something that's going to be big enough to accommodate these people and allow people to distance and allow all of that. Um, but no place like that is open for a booking right now. And we had started, you know, trying to find this back in September. Um, many, many people we talked to, um, and everyone absolutely lovely trying to be the most accommodating, but everyone has to look out for themselves in this time. And so it came to a point where we just decided to gut my parents' house and record it there. So we gutted the front entryway. There's like a little sitting area that's connected to the front entryway and a living room. I took out all the furniture. We put down a bunch of rugs that our neighbors had and we had. It was truly a community effort. Um, put down lug rugs to kind of soundproof it. And then through the hallway leading back to like me and my sister's bedrooms were um, the band throughout that hallway. 
Um, our drummer, Nick Peters, my sister Mitra was in New York at the time, so she was at home. So we kind of stole her bedroom, um, completely gutted that, set up his drum kit in there um, and had a video feed so that Nick could watch Anthony conducting um, while still being pretty far away from him. And so and we had- If I can jump in on that right there. Yeah, go for that it. was on its own such an interesting experience to set up because yeah. obviously there's no CCTV built into your house. No. Um, and so we no. had to get like an old laptop and open photo booth and then plug it into um, just like three different like computer monitors that we like spaced and we had to get like a 50 foot HDMI cord. And so we could then like stream everything. We had like mics between each other. It was wild. It was wild. It was, I think it'll be great for the future biographies. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the pictures are like so fun. It looks amazing. Like the actual footage, I don't even know if you'd fully tell in a lot of the footage that oh, this is a house. Um, but it was just kind of kind of an amazing, funky experience that's truly one of a kind to this year. Um, so when we began recording, we turned my parents' house into a sound studio. Um, we brought in um, really crew became such a important part of this process. So we had Cassidy Alberico um, as our videographer. We had Alejo and Jay come in and do all of our sound. Um, they were amazing at setup and they have been mixing the whole thing in post-production and doing all that fun stuff. We had an amazing stage manager team and a court of party and Sophia Mateen who ran it so well. I we, like, we are so thankful for our team. Anthony, I would have, we, both directed, so I was able to direct the show and Anthony Music directed and we both produced. If we had to do anything more than that, we might have passed away. <laughs> so, so <laughs> great. <laughs> Honestly, lifesavers. And also, for the most part, most of our team and our cast and our band were ASU students. And so professional. So, like, I am, ASU does such a good job at preparing their students for their lines of work because it was such an amazing team. Absolutely. And I think it's important to mention that like these weren't even solely just performing arts uh, majors or students. Yeah. Um, Nick Peters, for example, our drummer is a biomedical engineering student. Um, when we look at like a number of our cast, they came from such a wide background where we even had on the performance that we even had grad students um, in vocal performance yeah. and opera. And then our leading lady was a freshman here. And yeah. the, the amount of talent and the amount of professionalism that every single person brought to the table, truly a gift to this project. Yeah, I also, I also feel very blessed because, you know, at the end of the day, we're just 19 and 20. And a large part of our team was older than, was older than us. And they absolutely, like, the respect was there. We were all on the same level. Um, and it, it just felt really good to have, you know, also when you're doing something that you've written, it's like your baby, you know. <laughs> It's the first time you're putting it out into the world and to have people who you can trust and also give like such amazing feedback and are fully a part of the collaborative process. I fully believe that a lot of our cast understands the characters better than I do and I wrote them. <laughs> but after talking, like, oh my goodness, I never would have thought about interpreting that way. But you're entirely right. Cast members staying afterwards to talk to us about character development and, you know, our plans for future drafts of it. But truly an amazing team. <laughs> I, I could go it on. Really it really was. <laughs> and, and when we talk about like the end result, um, yeah. you know, the recording process was of course intense. We did it over four days um, for a couple hours each day. We, you know, of course brought the equipment in. We would break our scenes and songs into what we called chunks. Um, and then we would be able to say, Sara would start every chunk by saying, chunk three, take two. And she would go, you know, uh, camera, camera, and then like sound, roll, and we go action and it was this pseudo um, this pseudo sort of like film set and so when we take those chunks and now they're being revised they're being cleaned they're being edited by um alejo gordillo and uh jayla ben um seeing the work that they're doing and getting those back to us being able to get feedback it's such an involving and almost rewarding or not, not almost it, it yeah. is a rewarding process yeah and so i i'm so proud of you you all if you want to join us you'll be able to see the final product um we are airing it february 26th through march 14th um you can stream it from your own homes we've got a lot of screening dates you can buy tickets um on eventbrite that's b-r-i-t-e if you just search leading ladies a new musical you can also follow um our instagram procopio underscore mateen or our facebook page leading ladies a new musical original workshop production to kind of keep up with us but the final product is so 
amazing. I am overwhelmed. I knew, like, the thing is, I feel like you always underestimate yourself. You know what I mean? And that, you know, when we started this, we've talked, we've talked about how it's so beyond us now. It truly is. Like, you know, it started in a practice room. If anyone wanted to hear it, they had to talk to one of us. Um, and we both just had this kind of overwhelming moment where on one of our recent videos on our Instagram, like a bunch of people were commenting who we didn't know at all. <laughs> and we're like, oh my, it's out, it's going to be out in the world and you guys can see it and the world can see it. And my head may explode when that happens, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> and so to quote um, the show itself, <laughs> as the product makes it worth it, uh, we wanted to share a little clip of the start of the show, Prologue Part 1, which is right here. up stars out the product makes it worth it cameras cancel all the faults make it paradise but perfect it's a hassle and a half it's true yes there's producers and there's divas but today i'm a believer that you gotta play the game to win the smallest ounce of fame well you need to make your moving photograph succeed <laughs> Shit up, it's only the beginning, how could anything go wrong when it's day one of filming? But it's Rick's first day on set. Oh, 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 oh. I'd rather dangle from the news before I let on the producer. NBC's what we've been working on and I would feel we'll all be gone. Gone before the film is even out the door. When we talk about the community of like ASU, uh, when we look at like the School of Music, Dance, and Theater, and we talk about the School of Film, honestly, it is such a rewarding experience to be able to work with such talented and intelligent students and community yeah. members. Um, honestly, I think it's easy to forget that these are students. Um, <laughs> and when we, when we talk about ASU just being the university as large as it is, the resource it has, the connections it has, and Ultimately, the support that it has for students um, is an incredibly rewarding one. And to be able to work with such talented people who, who want to make it in this world and who want to work with you and who want to see you succeed as much as you want to see them succeed, it's such a great experience to work with them. Also, a big thank you that I have is also to the faculty and staff at ASU. I was able to make the writing process for our show a part of my senior project. So Kristen Hunt came on as my faculty advisor and helped advise me through the collaboration and kind of coach and mentor me through that. Um, and even after my senior project finished and we were done throughout this, I've been able to reach out to her and she's a director herself. And just, this was my first time directing and producing. And so sometimes I would email her with a frantic question and she would get back to me within the day. And the fact that we have, you know, faculty and just an entire community at ASU that supports everyone and the community itself is, I'm so grateful for it. We also have specifically Gamage to thank for you and I meeting. <laughs> Can we thank Marley Jessen? <laughs> the love of our lives, Marley Jessen. Yeah, we met at Gamage. We both work on house staff. Um, we, we would not have met each other if not for that. So like also giving students opportunities to work jobs at ASU. There are so many amazing jobs that ASU provides that, you know, if you need a job, then it's great to have one at your school. Me and Anthony both clearly well, need that. Even when we talk about jobs that are... Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I was going to say, even when we talk about jobs that are like career-specific to the students, I mean, yes. you and I both want to work in this field, and being able to work at ASU Gamage and to be able to 
see chunks of Broadway material and be able to like watch it and listen to it day after day and be able to interact yeah. with the people that see it. We get a great feel for what people want and what works and what doesn't. And it just, it's such an incredible learning experience that I think we're both so grateful for to have at the young ages of 19 and 20. Yeah. We're, okay, can we say that we're specifically thankful for Wicked being here for five weeks and both of us seeing it? Yes. Because, because Anthony and I, for some reason, we both know a lot of musicals. We both know completely opposite parts of musical theater history and productions. And so if we had a moment we were writing, I'd be like, oh, it's like this from this musical. And Anthony's like, I've never seen it. Is it like this from this musical? He's like, and I'd be like, I've never seen that one. And so Wicked, because we both worked at Gamage and it was there for five weeks and we saw it a zillion times. We're like, it's like this part from Wicked. <laughs> what I would say is like the biggest benefit to specifically our writing process. <laughs> yeah. Ultimately, like the environment that we were in was what made this possible. So like a big thank you to Gamage, to our boss, Marley Jessen, um, to the Digital Connections team, um, to each measure. Um, big thank you to my own faculty, like Alex Temple um, in the composition faculty was wonderful to go through my music with me throughout the semester um, and guide me to, to even be more innovative with how I structure things. Big thank you to my voice professor, um, Nathan, uh, Nathan Deshaun Myers, who helped me in terms of like actually conducting and, and bringing together a rehearsal space like that. Um, and of course, big thank you to all of Sara's huge influences. <laughs> Thanks to you too, Anthony. <laughs> I think one of the things that for me that I struggled with for a long time is like, you want to do this thing and you need to find a collaborator. I feel like finding collaborators is something that's really hard to do because you have a dream, you're like, I have this vision, but I obviously need help. And my biggest advice to people, um, and just finding a collaborator, which is the first step in a collaborative process is know what your friends do. I would say a hundred percent, especially ASU is like such a talented community. But honestly, everywhere is, everywhere is. There, people have little niche interests. Talk to people and know what they do. Because most of our team was sourced from people who we knew before. There's quite a few newbies, like, to our lives in the team. But, you know, our stage manager, Anna, we also met at Gamage House Staff, um, who was a brilliant stage manager. And we knew that she liked the management side of theater because we had talked to her. Um, and so 100% finding collaborators, the best way to do it, know what your friends do. Know what everyone in your life does, because everyone has an intense passion that they, they want an outlet for. And they will be happy to work with you if, you know, it's, I feel like as an artist, it's sometimes kind of hard to understand and find people who are as passionate about the things as you are. Um, so I just say talk to people. Um, and that's the biggest step in finding someone. I would 100% agree. And I think on top of that, you can add, just keep going with it. It, it sounds cliche yeah. to say, you know, you know, don't, don't let the people that say no stop you. But oftentimes the world says no. And it's not like you can be mad at somebody. It's, it's just circumstances. And I think yeah. as the last year has told everybody, it's, it's basically that like the world can change on a dime. And you choose how you respond to it. You choose how you're going to adapt or if you're going to decide to, let's say, offset what you're going to do. Or you, you, you decide how you're going to react to it. And I think when it comes down to it, this show is a great way for both of us to build, I think, personally, as, as well as like artists. Because at least for me, being able to find the discipline and find like the dedication to something when it seemed like the world was kind of getting worse and worse and worse, that was something that I am so grateful I had the chance to work through and to, to build as an individual. And I mean, maybe I'm speaking on behalf of Sara when I say that like, this was such an incredible opportunity for us as just like adolescents, <laughs> as yeah. young adults in the world who are extremely excited to start doing this as like a career. Um, so I'm extremely grateful for it. I would say we both worked harder this year than we ever have in our lives. Yes. And I think because of that, I feel more confident in life now. And I think it's, I mean, having you as a collaborator, Anthony, and like someone to lean on, I think has been like one of the best parts of this experience. And I think it's hard in collaboration to have open communication. I would like anyone in a collaborative process, talk to your people, talk to them about how you're feeling because no one's perfect. 
no one's like no collaborative process is going to be a hundred percent you agree on everything everything goes a hundred percent smoothly because you know that's the glory of it you're finding it out together and you're gonna have a different opinion sometimes but that doesn't mean that it's bad it's just a it's part of the collaborative process um and so any moment in our collaboration when i've been like mm, this thing's bubbling up inside the second i tell you i feel better about it and that that would probably be one of my like top five advice to people um is talk to the people you know find out what they do and once you start working with them continue having an open dialogue with them because it's always better when you we talked about every little thing for this production yes we we were each other's brains you know and we're the, so, same <laughs> we're the same brain so and which we also extended i mean we didn't overcrowd our team with information they probably didn't need to have but you know just keeping an open dialogue creating a community where people feel safe and allowed to ask questions because we both took on leadership roles in this process we are both responsible so like our collaborative our collaborative process extended from just you and I as writers, but then when we became directors, we had a like, you know a whole team of people that we had to collaborate with. And the most, the happiest thing I can say about a rehearsal room is that, you know, when you're working with the people who wrote the show, I as an actor would maybe feel timid to like give suggestions or whatever if the writers didn't create like a, a you know, an open community. And so the fact that our cast members, that we created a community where everyone felt safe to like bring their ideas to the table. Um, and that, I, I mean, I fully believe that how people perceive something that you, as an artist, we create things. Um, and a lot of times because that person, like because you created it, it's easy to think like, oh, I'm the only one who knows exactly the answers to all the questions that this thing brings up. And I think the amazing thing about the, like any art piece is that anyone's viewpoint of it is just as valid. The audience is such a big part of the theatrical experience. Um, and so I'm just happy. I'm so excited to see audiences reactions to the show because I think that those are just as helpful. I think it's, you know, it's the actor, it's the writer, it's the director, and it's ultimately the audience. It's the whole team. Well, thank you so much for watching ASU Gambage's Digital Connections and Each Measure program. My name is Anthony James from Copio. My name is Sarah Armatine, and this was Each Measure.